Hi lovelies and welcome to the Witch's Cookery. Today I have some practical green witch tips and tricks for you. We are going to talk about how to know you are a green witch or better phrased, how to know if the green witchcraft path is something that suits or fits you. I'll be sharing a lot of thoughts and knowledge around being a green witch for beginners. And furthermore, we'll also look into magical herbs and plants and how they're used in witchcraft, where magical correspondences come from and how a green witch can work her magic. And if you're familiar with my channel, you know we will do so very thoroughly and with a critical, practical and scientific eye. Of course, all the information provided is presented from my own frame of reference, from my experiences, from my knowledge and from my background. So as with any advice given on the internet, take the things that resonate with you and ignore the things that don't. Okay, my lovely witches, put on your earmuffs and let's start this first herbology class. So let's first get the basics out of the way. What is green witchcraft? What do we understand if someone is talking about being a green witch? Now, all these types of terms are actually quite new. They're at the moment a little bit of a fashion and I talked about different kinds of witches in this video linked above, if you're interested in that. Now, a lot of witches don't like labels, but others find them very helpful. And here with a term, we can kind of classify what we do. So green witchcraft basically just means that you're working with herbs and there are different ways that you can do so. You can work with plant spirit, you can work with the medicinal properties of herbs with herbalism, you can work with the magical attributes and correspondences of certain herbs and plants, or you can also dabble in ethnobotany, which is kind of a mix of all the above. Now we often hear a green witch is someone that keeps a thousand house plants and has her own garden and does this and does that. In my opinion, that's not really necessary. Not everyone has the opportunity or the option to grow grow plants or to go foraging for plants, for example, if you live in a city, but you can still work green witchcraft. Not every kitchen witch knows how to flambe a reduced cully de framboise. So I think it's also totally possible to have a green witch with a black thumb. I too might be to blame for the death of one or two cacti in my career as a witch. <gasps> now let's go a little bit deeper and look into the main ways to work with herbs and what kind of energies or benefits they can bring to our practice in witchcraft. Craft. As I have just mentioned, some witches will work with plant spirit. That, for example, is done in shamanism, in Native American cultures, also in the Celtic and the Germanic background. From culture to culture, this will be different and different plants will be assigned a spirit or a god or some kind of energy about them. And a lot of times that knowledge or that belief is founded in folklore and mythology of the culture. You can see traces of this still in modern times and my favorite example is the Celtic and Germanic tree cult. For Beltane or Mayday or Walpurgisnacht or whatever you want to call it, a maypole is erected and usually that pole is made from a birch tree because in belief it said that the birch holds all the youthful powers and it was also connected or said to be home of the different fertility and spring goddesses. To this day in Ireland people put little ribbons on hawthorn bushes in order to make their wishes. Another example would be the oak tree, which is also very important in a lot of pantheons and mythology in Europe. For the Greeks, for the Romans, for the Celts, for the Teutonic tribes, for the Slavs. The oak was always the symbol or the home of their most important god in that pantheon. Like Taurus, Zeus, Jupiter or Dacta. So the reason why the oak was this almighty big tree with that strong spirit, that strong godly connection is of course it was the tallest tree. And if you're a little bit familiar with those pantheons, you will also know that all those gods are actually in connection with thunder. The reason for that is that oaks actually have a very, very high chance to be struck by lightning. First of all, they are higher up than all the other trees. So the electricity will first hit them and the tree soaks a lot of water. So they are full of water, which also makes it more likely that thunder would hit them. And that's basically how those plant spirits came to be. People just observed what happened around them and then assigned it a specific energy or a specific deity. Or specific flowers are used for aura 
oracles. You might also use specific plants for protection in your home, for decoration in your home, that at your belief or in your culture hold some kind of spirit in them. For me, for example, it would be the elder tree with Holda or Frau Holle, or of course the hazelnut, which is still to this day hung in Bavarian households as a protective item. Another example for this would be the specific wood that's used to bind a besom. And I know I mentioned a lot of trees, but that's just because it's in my own culture and I know the most about that. But as I said, many other cultures around the world also work with those plant spirits. So they looked into how the plant grows, what its life cycle is, which animals would eat it, which would avoid it, where the different plants would grow. And from that, they're just gathered a connection to their own belief system. So a second way to work your magic as a green witch is through herbology or herbalism. Herbalism is basically the study of botany and plants for medicinal purpose. Other than the plant spirit, this is all founded in science and actual facts, in what kind of compounds are in the plant, how are they working on other organisms, for example, our body, our mind. Which part of the plant carries what kind of ingredients, how to care for them, how to harvest them, how to dry them, how to use them, how to prepare them and conserve them or extract different kind of compounds, how to apply it, when to apply it, how much of it to apply, it, when and when not to use it. And for medicinal use, obviously the workings on our physiology and with that also on our psychology. In Western culture, herbal remedies and herbal medicine is often used used as an additional help to modern medicine. But there are of course also cultures where the herbal and the traditional medicine is almost at the same rank as the modern ones. For example, with traditional Chinese medicine. So this form of working with plants often finds appliance in witchcraft when it comes to making tinctures, making salves, making tea blends, making healing broths and soups. In kitchen witchery, of course, as well. In all those little home remedies that you know from your grandma and that you know will always make you feel better. A lot of green witches keep little apothecaries where they have their herbal remedies for different kinds of ailments and obviously additionally to only using the medicinal benefits you can also always infuse it with some intention. Now the forefathers or foremothers of this were the monasteries and cloisters, the nuns and the monks between around the 6th and the 12th century because they did a ton of research on those topics, on working with plants, on healing with plants. That's why, especially in Europe, you still have the monasteries with those beautiful herb gardens. And I can only give you the tip to visit one if you have one close by, because they also often have very cool courses surrounding herbalism. They have all the good books and you can really learn a lot there in a very lovely and calm environment. A little bit later on in this video, I will give you way more green witch tips and tricks. But first, let's look at the third big way to working with plants, and that's magical correspondence. Now, post to the medicinal herbalism, which obviously in a lot of cultures will deliver the same kind of results. Magical correspondences are very bound to different backgrounds, different beliefs, different vegetation and, of course, subjective opinions and experiences. Because we first have to think about how are magical correspondences found. Like, we can't really measure them. There is no a scientific way, obviously, to extract them from a plant. So let's look into how people come up with them. And a lot of it we can actually also read in those old books from the monasteries and cloisters from the medieval ages. Because people just like today try to make sense of the environment around them and how everything fits together. So what they came up with is what we today know as sympathetic magic. So what that means is that you have an object, in this case it would be a plant or an herb or a fungi, and you look at it and you look at its shape or its color or its smell. And from that, you try to gather some kind of symbolic meaning for yourself or for your life or for your body. So for example, we have this plant, which name I can't remember in English right now, <laughs> which leaves look like, which leaves, which leaves, which leaves, the leaves of which. Oh my God. The leaves of which... Now I forgot what I want to say. 
The leaves of which look like the liver, so it was used to treat liver ailments. Or for example, you had a red plant or a plant that produced a red sap and that was thought to be good for your blood or cleansing to your blood, for example, because both are red. So you see what people did there, they just tried to find that connection. Obviously, that was from a scientific medical point of view, not always correct, but they believed in it and that carried through the ages. So today, a lot of that we perceive as the magical correspondences. And we still do that. For example, a lot of greenery is now connected to money because money is green. Well, not, not here, but in the States. And of course, our traditional herbs next to the botanical name have a lot of folk names. And if you look at them, they, they are very funny sounding usually. You can see what people back then believed that plant could on a magical level do for them. You have a lot of protection plants, which I should have looked up before I started making this video because I only know the German word. <laughs> here they are, there you go these that due to their shape or the time of year they bloomed were connected to either a specific deity or connected to a specific ailment or connected to women or kids or cows whatever and were said to work their magic on them a lot of those magical correspondences also come from tradition maybe you have asked yourself why people put a bay leaf into their wallet or burn a bay leaf for monetary gain or to attract money. That's probably because of the Roman tradition back in the times when a commander of the troops of the Romans was successful in battle and he would return to the city. He would be crowned with a little um, bay laurel wreath on his head and then later on the Roman Emperor started to wear it and now it is still used in some cultures to honor athletes when they win. So it obviously was a symbol of power and of success and of wealth. So that's why we now associate a bay leaf with a magical ability to attract money. So it's definitely important to keep in mind that those correspondences are not rules, they are suggestions. They are based on someone's experience, sometimes maybe only a lucky coincidence. They're based on observations, on subjective opinions and a lot on cultural beliefs. So personally, I am not a big fan of lists or books like I don't dare to say because I know I will get a lot of shit in the comments for this. Scott Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Magical Correspondences has just one dude's opinion. It's for sure a good frame of reference if you want to work with that person's opinions. But personally, I also think it's great if you can build your own relationship with plants or if you actually look and research why certain abilities are assigned to that herb or that plant that you're using. Because I do think if you don't feel a connection with a certain plant or with a certain herb, chances are that it won't do much for you anyway. And I think your magic might work just a bit stronger if you actually feel that that plant is doing something for you. Obviously, only my opinion. So a very common way green witchcraft is worked is by burning certain herbs in smoke bundles as one herb in form of a spell, in form of incense or over a little coal or fire. Depending on your culture, this will vary and also the herbs and spices that you use for that will vary greatly. I know a lot of people are in love with their sage, which is actually spread through a lot of parts in the world. But if you look a little bit more in your own culture, you might actually make some really cool discoveries which herbs were traditionally burned in different times of the year for different purposes. Especially interesting if you're into folk witchcraft and folklore. Burning herbs is done for many different purposes, for cleansing, invoking happiness, for protections, for blessings. And of course, you also have them for health reasons. 
think about a seam or a sauna. And while we are at the topic of burning stuff, another way to work with herbs and plants is to smoke or inhale them. In various cultures this was done to connect with the spirit world, to widen your own mind and heighten your experiences, or even for medicinal purpose. A very popular way at the moment to work with herbs are little jars or spell bags that work mainly with magical correspondence and plant spirit, where different ingredients are put in those containers in order to aid your spell. A similar method that's more influenced by the medicinal properties would be to make sachets, either for sleeping or for staying calm, anti-anxiety and stuff like that. Then you can of course use herbs and plants for ingestion, so for eating and drinking, for kitchen witchery, for brewing magical teas, herbal teas, medicinal teas, for bringing some extra magic in your food, or as mentioned before to make healing potions. Another very hands-on way to work with herbs is obviously herbs for any kind of application on your skin, for example through oils, through creams, through tinctures. This is usually done either for healing purposes purposes or a lot of times also for different kinds of blessings. You also have a lot of compelling oils for example and you cannot only apply them on your body, you can also for example apply them on spell candles. And all my cottage witches out there will know the use of herbs for for example cleaning supplies to infuse them for their cleansing actually scientific properties as well as their magical and energetical property. In the folk and witchcraft traditions in the Germanic influenced areas to this day we will work a lot with plants and woods to touch people because we believe that they carry some kind of spirit in them that can help people that will jump over on people. Examples for this would be the Easter whip or the Krampus stuff. But that can also combine ancient belief and actual medicinal workings. For example, if you have been in a Russian sauna, a banja, and they had this birch twigs where they will whip your back in order to help with the blood flow. But of course, as I said before, the birch is also very closely connected to fertility and to vigor and to life power. Now, anyone who gardens, especially people that are more familiar with folk witchcraft, might also know about the different plants in your culture that you traditionally have on your ground. For example, here it's thought to be very sacred. If you have an elder tree on your ground, you would not cut that down because that's considered bad luck. Or in some areas, people will plant rosemary bushes around their grounds in order to protect their house, which also again ties back to that plant spirit belief. Some people have fairy gardens, so there's also many ways how you can grow plants in a witchcraft purpose or in a kind of green witch setting. And we don't want to forget about offerings or altar decorations that you might have in your home where you might use plants to bring in a certain energy from the season or represent that energy in your home and in your workings. Now let's get to those green witch tips and tricks on how you can level up your skills, how you can make your green witchcraft practice or your witchcraft practice in general richer by working with plants and herbs. So if possible for you it would be My god, I thought for a second I didn't press record. I've been talking for an hour! <laughs> I did, I did. Hello, people. Sorry, I might edit this out though. So as mentioned before, it can only be beneficial to build your own relationship with the plants you work with, to just have a deeper understanding of how they're grown, what they can bring you specifically, how they work on your body, how they work on your mind, and how they work in your magic and your witchcraft. And in order to do so, you could of course get familiar with your local plants that are there. You don't always have to order them online or you know use the plants that everyone and their grandma on the internet are using. You can also use the plants that are native to your area because a lot of times they're just not really represented online or in books because maybe the author doesn't live 
there or doesn't know about them. But I'm certain they have their own folklore, their own myth, their own healing powers and you can really look into that. By looking into guided tours, maybe you can find a herbalist in your area that you can ask to show you around. As I mentioned before, the monasteries are a great place for research. If you live outside Europe, that might not be possible for you. But maybe you have an institute in your city that offers herbology classes. There are also a lot of courses online that you could take. It's always worth it to look into one that actually teaches you about your local plants. A great way to connect with a specific plant or herb is to actually grow it yourself. And you don't need a garden or an outdoor space for that. A lot of things also grow great inside. You can have your own little witchy herb garden on your windowsill. Or you can just get that one plant that you really observe through its life cycle, how it grows, how it develops, what needs it has in terms of light and water, what benefits it has, and you can really research that. Here I would just recommend getting really good botany books, scientific books, because from that, again, you can draw your own correspondences of that plant, what it can bring to your life, what you can learn from it, or how you can use it in your craft. And I think the Weybot Witch made a really lovely video on that. I will link it for you down in the description box. Growing your own herbs is obviously also sustainable. You don't have to ship them. It's cheaper. It's very rewarding and you can practice to turning your black thumb into a green one um, in a very non-intimidating way. If your kitchen witchery and cottage witchery is really enriching, if you know that you have grown those plants yourself and you have fueled them with some extra energy, I just did post a little seedling spell over on Patreon where I explain how you can work a spell into the things you grow and harvest that energy as well. When it comes to wild foraging, keep in mind that there are a couple of rules that differ from country to country and just in general a couple of guidelines to keep you and the plant life safe. I have made another video on the topic if you want to check it out, it's linked up here. And for that I would recommend to get a local plant guide. I can't recommend one because you have to get one for your specific area that tells you more about the different collection times, what grows there and especially what other plants are there that might be toxic and looking very similar to the one that you want to pick. <laughs> I've now read in so many witchcraft groups that people were complaining about every time I burn sage I feel sick or I get like dizzy. My answer to this is then don't burn it. There are so many other plants that you can use for that. You might have an allergy to a certain herb or a certain plant so it might not be suitable for your witchcraft. Just use a different one in your practice. It doesn't always have to be the super hype plant that everyone is using. Just look what else is out there. So that's, that's a big tip here. See how plants work for you. If you're into folk witchcraft and the traditional uses for plants in that, I would also recommend getting a couple of books on the specific mythology, the specific cultures. They don't have to be witchcraft books. They will already have a lot of stories in them, even a lot of old storybooks, like a lot of the Brother Grimm storybooks, the original ones have a lot of cool stuff hidden in there. And for a witchcraft book that I can actually recommend on a topic, it is super hyped, you will know the title, but I actually got it because I read about it so much. And I have to say it's pretty good. There are pretty good green witch tips and tricks in there. There's a lot of information in there also on wild foraging, on how to work with herbs. So it is definitely worth its money. It's a cute little book to have. It's a very easy read. It's The Green Witch by Hiscock Murphy. I've linked it down below together with a couple of other items that you might find helpful on your green witch path. Well, I do think that was it from my side so far. Let me know how you work with herbs herbs, how you work with plants or what you consider green witchcraft in general. Also let me know if you would be interested in seeing more green witch spells from one of those three categories or maybe mixed together and I'll see what I can do. Have the most magical day and I'll see you very soon. Goodbye!